opportunity to lift your voice in worship now. We're going to sing a song the choir and the orchestra is going to play, but we want you to sing along too. It's four familiar Christmas carols, but I'm going to tell you, they have set the bar really high this morning. And we're going to finish up with a different stanza, but we're going to finish up with Silent Night. Sing along with us and let this be your offering of worship and praise to God this morning.
please join me as we pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you this morning for this special time of the year when we come to worship you. The awe and majesty of your creation becomes ever more apparent. Lord, we ask you to clear our minds this morning so that we can focus on your plan of redemption through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask that you would give peace to the world. And Lord, I ask that it begin in my heart right, right now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Well, it's been good to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with you this morning. And now I ask you if you would turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 22 through 38 together. Luke chapter 2, continuing to focus our attention in Luke's gospel, what's known as the birth narrative in Luke. And we're going to walk with Mary and Joseph and Jesus from the manger into the temple to get Luke's concluding thoughts about the significance of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Luke, in these verses, gives us the rest of the story. Luke chapter 2. And in doing so, we're going to rest in and ruminate on these verses together in preparation for the Lord's Supper. And so I hope you have uh, in your hand uh, one of these Lord's Supper packets. Uh, This is new for us. We've never done this before. So first, fair hope. I'm I'm, I'm believing you to to, to be able to manage this, all right? It's highly technical, but uh, uh, we'll get through it together uh, because I want us uh, on These days leading up to the celebration of Christmas, we need to recognize the central significance of the purpose that Christ came to the earth. And the Lord's Supper helps to tell the rest of the story of Christmas that must be known in order to understand it. In 1965, America saw for the very first time a Charlie Brown Christmas. I don't think you can really get through the rest of the Christmas season properly unless you watch a Charlie Brown Christmas. And if you're familiar with that story, and, and I'm certain that everyone uh, in this room, uh, everyone uh, on, uh, uh, online is, is familiar with, with poor, hapless Charlie Brown, right? He just, though it's, it's, he's got a heart of gold, yet uh, for some reason things just always go wrong for him. And so Charlie Brown is trying to get an understanding of Christmas, and he sees the the way the culture around him is celebrating it. And it's all about busyness and, 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 and commercialism and the, the, the externals of, of gift giving and getting. But Charlie Brown senses there is something more to it. He's been given one job by his friends to purchase the Christmas tree for the school play. And remember the tree that he got? The old raggedy, wouldn't even hold up an ornament uh, kind of thing. And he couldn't even do one job the right way. Everyone is laughing at him because he fails again. And you remember that scene. It's the climax of a Charlie Brown Christmas. While everyone's laughing at him, Charlie Brown exclaims in a loud voice, isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? And who speaks up next? Good old Linus with his security blanket there, walks to the center of the stage and in that cute voice says, lights please. And then he stands and he quotes verses eight to 14 of Luke chapter two, beginning with the shepherds who've gathered in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night and concluding with the angel choir's declaration, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill towards men. And then he says, Charlie Brown, that's what Christmas is all about. And he's exactly right. And while there was dissension and discord among that little group of friends, everyone in the story gathers around that message of what Christmas is really all about. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And those verses that Linus quotes give us Although we're familiar with it, we need to recognize every Christmas the strangeness of that story, this declaration. It's astounding that Charles Schultz was able to to get this on a news channel or, or a TV channel for all of America to hear this strange story of God coming flesh and coming down to earth as a baby for you and for me. And yet it's the most important story in the world. But we've got to understand and have the opportunity together this morning to to understand the significance of that story. What does it mean that God has come down? What was begun in that act of God's giving of himself to us? Well, the Last Supper closes the narrative loop for us. Loop will get to from chapter 2 to chapter 22 and give us the night in which Jesus was betrayed in which he lays out using words 
and using deeds to be able to articulate what it is that's been given to us at Christmas. And so the title of my message this morning is Christmas Crucified. It's borrowed from a a statement that uh, the Apostle Paul makes in 1 Corinthians in which he said, I've determined to know one thing. I've decided to just get my attention and my life and all that I am focused on one thing. I don't want to be wise according to the things of the world. I'm willing to be a someone who could be considered to be a fool because I believe one thing. The whole wisdom of God is in Christ crucified. And so what we acknowledge together at Christmas time as followers of Jesus is there's a reason why that baby was born. Why is it? Why was Jesus born? He was born to die. He was born to die. And as paradoxical as that sounds to us, it is actually the key to everything. It's the key to Christmas. It's the key to the Word. It's a key to understanding God's purposes for all things. It's a key to God himself. And it's a key to what we're for and why we're here and how we are to live. What you have in this little cup, what you have with this little wafer of bread is the explanation of everything you need and everything that God has done. And so I hope you'll hold this little cup in your hand as I preach. You'll let your hearts get ready for what it says to you and everything you need to know about Christmas is contained in this little cup. In fact, until the cradle is connected to the cross, you don't understand Christmas. Until the cradle is connected to the cross, you haven't understood the story of Christmas. We, we leave it in the cradle, then it's a nice little story about a sweet little baby and, 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 and warmth and, and, and an attempt at goodwill towards each other. Except, what is the story of our goodwill towards each other? It's not very good. It's a revelation of our deep need for something transformational in our lives together. And so you don't understand Christmas until the cradle is connected to the cross. Let's stand together in the reading of God's word. Luke chapter two, verse 22. And what's going on here very quickly is Mary and, Jesus, Mary and Joseph have taken Jesus into the temple because that's where observant Jews uh, would take their newborns so about 40 days after the baby was born, they would, they would have this ceremony and truly devout Jews like Joseph and Mary, they would have actually gone to the temple, wanted to be in the temple to present their baby before the Lord and to bring a redemption of the firstborn, which is really what's happening in, uh, on this day. And so verse 22 of Luke 2, Luke writes, and when... The days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed. And this speaks specifically to Mary. There was a time period after childbirth that a woman would have to wait to go to the temple. And that's been completed. They, that's Mary and Joseph, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Verse 24. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in spirit in the spirit, into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then Simeon took Jesus into his arms and blessed God and said, now, Lord, you're releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. And the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother, that's that's Mary and Joseph. His father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and he said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will, will pierce even your own soul to the end that the thoughts 
for many hearts may be revealed. And there was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, serving night and day with fasting and prayer. And at that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all of those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. You may be seated. Everyone was looking for redemption. Everyone had this question. Can someone tell me what it's all about? Everyone comes with Charlie Brown's question. Can anyone, is there anyone who can tell me what Christmas is all about? And what I want you to know this morning, because maybe the story of Christmas and Christianity is a little bewildering to you. Everything you know is right here. Everything you need to know is right here. The cradle, the manger, the baby is pointing to this. So the first thing I want you to see in this text and in this bread and cup, this is Scripture. This is Scripture. One of the things you ought to do if you have time as you prepare for Christmas is just look at the absolute scriptural saturation of these passages. There is just, if you have a Bible that has references in it, you'll find biblical references from the Old Testament all throughout what is written here. In Simeon's actions and in Simeon's words, he just has all of these woven together illusions from from, uh, the prophets as they foretell the expected one who will come, that's finally come in the Messiah, Jesus. The church history has referred to Simeon's speech speech as as the nunc dimittis, the nunc dimittis. There's your Latin uh, that uh, that you'll want a little bit of that at church before before you go. And so the nunc dimittis uh, really means in Latin, now I can depart, or now you have have sent me away, Uh, now I can depart because I've seen your Messiah. And that nunc dimittis, when Simeon says, now my eyes have finally seen the Savior. What Simeon is saying is, God, you've kept your promises in your word. You've kept your promises in your word. Mary and Joseph have come to this place. They've come to the temple in obedience to the word of God. Scripture is quoted all throughout this passage. They are coming to present their firstborn because God's word has told them to do that. Exodus 13 and Leviticus 12 and Nehemiah 10, they're to come and present their child before the Lord according to his instruction. Simeon is really replicating the story in 1 Samuel, the presentation of the prophet Samuel to Eli who gathers that little boy to himself who's been dedicated to the Lord. When Simeon speaks, uh, he is speaking out of Isaiah 40. Comfort, oh comfort my people. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40 verses one through eight speaks of of that moment when the way uh, is being prepared for the Lord and salvation is being revealed to all peoples. At the end of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Isaiah 52.10 and 42.6 and 49.6 all speak of of a light to the nations, a light that's going to penetrate the darkness and salvation that's going to go all the way around the world. And that's in fulfillment of God's great promise to Abraham. Genesis chapter 12. God says, I'm going to find a way to bless the whole world, to set things right. I keep my promises. In the Lord's Supper, Jesus does the very same thing. In Luke 22, he weaves together all of these texts. My dissertation for my doctorate in theology was on the Last Supper. And I can tell you, Jesus, in an amazing way, taking suffering servant passages and and Daniel passages and Zechariah 9 and Exodus 24 and and Psalm 41 that speaks of, of the betrayal of one who dips his bread with me. And in that Last Supper, Jesus himself is pointing how the promises of Passover are being kept in the Messiah. After the resurrection of Jesus from the dead in Luke 24, he will say to his disciples, all of the scriptures, all of the scriptures are testifying to me. It's all summed up and completed and fulfilled in me. 
Several years ago, a couple of theologians and a, and a, a computer guy got together and, and made a, a visual illustration of the number of cross-references in the Scripture, how all of Scripture is wired together. I think Sharon's going to put that image up for me. Yes, yeah, there it is. There are 63,779 cross-references in the Scripture. Isn't that cool? And they used uh, colors to, to show how a Scripture is connected to another Scripture. And this, this shows the interconnectivity of all of God's Word. Isn't that wild? Isn't that cool? 63,000, almost 64,000 cross-references. I'd like to meet the guy who counted those up. Uh, but... Uh, but that's how integrated the scriptures are. And all of them wind their way beautifully around Christ. And so maybe your question this morning is, can anyone tell me what the Bible is all about? Can anyone tell me what the Bible is all about? These 66 books, and how does it all fit together? And some of it's a little hard for me to wrap my mind around. And all I want to say is this. This is scripture. The whole Bible testifying and preparing and getting us ready to understand the magnitude of what God and Christ has done for us. As we already heard this message, what is the word? What is the word that's announced in the coming of Christ? It's John 3, 16, God's love for the world. What don't you like about that message? God loves you. That's all of the scripture woven together to proclaim that to you. First of all, this is scripture. Second of all, this is love. Again, what is this word? It's a word of love. Out of God's great love for the world, broken and rebellious as it is, God proclaims through Jesus, I love you. Simeon, as he gives his speech uh, to, uh, and blessing over the Christ child, speaks of redemption and salvation and revelation and glory in verses 30. And 32. And then he goes on to tell Mary, and this is how this redemption and salvation is going to be accomplished. It's going to be accomplished through a piercing. Mary, your soul is going to be pierced because your son is going to be pierced. Mary and Joseph are coming to bring their firstborn and to redeem him. It speaks of a sacrifice that has to be given. A, Blood that's going to have to be shed in order to redeem the life of the firstborn. It's a picture that points to all the way to Passover. Remember the Passover story, the, the blood of the lamb smeared on the doorpost of the home would result in redemption and salvation for that whole family. The powerful covering of the blood and Jesus being there in the temple at the place, Mount Moriah, the exact same place, just a few feet away Jesus was from where Abraham had taken his only son, Isaac, to sacrifice him. And then there was a ram provided. There was redemption, atonement, sacrifice made for the purpose of rescuing. This is love. This is love. And what will happen one day, 33 years from this day, is Mary will watch as, his own, as her own firstborn, this time unwilling to accept anyone to stand in the way, but willing to go to be a sacrifice, pure, holy, blemishless. The Son has come to lay his life down for you and for me. And at the Last Supper, that is what Jesus says. This is my body and this is my blood poured out for you, what? For the forgiveness of sins, for the forgiveness of of sins. This is for you. This is for you. This is for you. I'm going to make a new covenant in my blood, Jesus says. And so maybe your question this morning is, is, is there anyone who can tell me what love is all about? When we, when we break down the deep longing of the heart of every single human being, it's the desire to, to love and to be loved. And all of our attempts at it in our own power and outside of Christ, they always come up short. They always end up failing us. They're, they're tainted and broken, as are we. Is there anyone who can tell me what love is all about? Well, the good news is God's word does. And it looks like this. Broken and spilled out and poured out for you. 
one who gives himself completely that you might be saved. This is love. This is what God's love looks like because this is what God looks like. This is scripture. This is love. This is God. Verse 26 says, Simeon was looking for Yahweh's Messiah, for the Lord's Christ. This is this one, this coming king, this one who comes. You have the coming together here in the temple of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. You have coming together in this temple, the return of the king to his rightful place. And yet it is this tiny baby that Simeon can hold in his arms, yet he's God, a very God. Your salvation, Simeon says, your light, your revelation, your redemption. This is God come down to us. This is God. This is how uh, the Apostle Paul would say it in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn. Remember, Mary and Joseph have brought their firstborn, and Paul says he is the firstborn over all creation. All of the fullness of God dwells in him. Now that completely bursts the bonds of our ability to capture it with our tiny minds. God made flesh, fully God, fully human at the same time. He is the firstborn over all creation. This is God, and this is what God looks like. This is what Jesus is saying at the Last Supper. If you want to understand who God is, he is not a God who takes. He is not a God uh, who, who stands with arms folded, glow, glowering over us in disappointment, but this God comes and pours himself out. The one true God, the God of Israel, who is also a God with a passion for the nations, is the God who gives the God who lavishes his love on us and celebrates when we come from darkness to light, when we come from death to life. If you want to get a sense of how Jesus is God and how all this fits together, in John's gospel in chapters 13 through 17, Jesus is, is in the upper room. It's when this Lord's Supper was celebrated and Jesus will speak of his unity with the Father and the love relationship between him and his Father. John chapter 13, this upper room, this last night of Jesus's begins with a declaration that Jesus knew that all authority had been given to him, that he was God, and he was in God, and God was in him. And the next thing he does is he lays aside his garments, takes the form of a servant, and washes the disciples' feet. Jesus will speak of the glory of God, the glory of God. In John's gospel, that's really a, a major theme, the glory of God. And Simeon speaks of it here, the glory of God. And what is the glory of God? Where is the glory, the very weight and reality of God? That's what glory means. Where is that most fully revealed? On the cross. On the cross. That is the glory of God. That's what our God looks like. He looks like this. It's this kind of God. I was reading an account of a campus minister at the University of, of, of Oxford in, in England, and his job is to reach college students, and he finds uh, that, uh, that uh, by and large, they are they're utterly secular. Uh, they absolutely have no place in their lives for religion, uh, and they'll, uh, when, when he invites them or tries to start conversations with them very often, they, they're very dismissive and say, I just don't believe in your God. And this campus minister has begun to say, well, well before you walk away, would you, would you describe for me this God that you don't believe? Because it's very likely that I don't believe in that God either. And these students will give a, a, a rendition of, of the God they don't believe in as this cosmic cop, this killjoy, this distant despot who's a, a, a sharpening his thunderbolts to pour them down on anybody who steps out of line. This sovereign sadist who just gets some joy out of all the suffering here or, a, or a, a, an uninterested deity who's just running a science experiment. We're just all like participants in an, in an ant farm. He's just watching from afar. Or the indulgent grandfather, sort of this a white bearded figure up in the sky who just wants everyone to be nice and maybe... Every so often, you can send him a card. 
but mostly he'll just stay out of your way. You mostly get those kind of renditions when people talk about the God they don't believe. And so this campus minister will say to them, well, I got, I got news for you. I don't believe in that God either. Will you give me a chance to tell you what the Bible says about the one true God? Because he will utterly obliterate your expectations. He's more and better than you could possibly imagine. This is God, the one who is for us. Maybe your question on this Christmas, is there anyone who can tell me what God is all about? These highfalutin theological ideas. Is there anyone who can tell me what God is all about? Here it is. Here's the main thing you need to know. God is like this. And then finally, when we know who God is, when we know what he's done for us, when we know what love is, then we come to figure out who we are. Simeon is righteous and devout. He's waiting on the consolation of Israel. He's waiting on redemption. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. Anna, her mind is focused on worship. Uh, their, their attention is on what God is doing and what God is up to. And when they see the Lord Jesus Christ, their souls are satisfied and they simply want to proclaim that good news to others. The firstborn. The firstborn needed to be redeemed because the firstborn belonged to the Lord because God was, was in a shadowy form saying the, the best life is the life rendered completely to God. The best way to live is to, is to be a living sacrifice. And so Paul will say, once you figure it out or once Jesus has poured himself out on you, you'll come to realize that the best life is the sacrifice life. You see, the big lie and the big problem is, is we think we're, we're born to live and then we die at the end. That's what most people assume is basically how it works. We're born to live and try to get as much of this life as we possibly can and then at the end we die and that's it. And that's completely wrong. Christ was born to reveal that you die to live. And he makes that possible for us. And he calls us into that same kind of life. Again, Colossians chapter one says this, uh, Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. He's the, he's the one who shows us what it really means to be alive because he is the one who lays his life down for others. And Colossians chapter two, verse 10. In him we find the completion. We find the finishing work for our own lives. And you'll have to make a decision about this. What, that's what Simeon means when he says, this child is a sign that's appointed for the rise and the fall of many. You're gonna have to make up your mind about Jesus and what he says about the word and what he says about God and what he says about love and what he says about you. Because Jesus says, I am a truth and I am a way and I am a life. And there's no other way to the Father but in me and in my life. That's what Jesus is saying at the, at the Last Supper. That was the whole point of my 180-page dissertation, where Jesus was saying so many things at the Last Supper, but one of the things that Jesus was saying is, your life, my life, is gonna fill your life. You're taking my way of being in the world into your life, and it will nourish and enliven your life as a life characterized by dying to live, dying to live. And it's the proclamation of that good news that changes the world. And it's that kind of living and loving that changes the people around you. Nunc dimittis. Simeon is saying now, I'm ready to die. I understand the keys to death and life. I understand what it means to live my life completely surrendered to the purposes of God and I am deeply satisfied and the world around me is changed. Now I can go, now I can go. Having laid my life down, now I can go to whatever is next for me. I hope that can be your cry at the conclusion of this service. Nunc dimittis, now I can go. Now I can depart. Now I can leave this place. This was to be an announcement and good news for the whole world. The Nunc dimittis is the, is the liturgy for, uh, for uh, several uh, different groups of believers. And, and in their evening services, they conclude the service with these words, Simeon's words. Now I can depart. 
Now I can depart. Now I can go because I've been satisfied in Christ and Christ alone. So maybe your question this morning is, is there anyone who can tell me what life is really all about? Can you, is there anyone who can tell me how life works? All of my efforts seem to come to nothing. All of my plans are kind of like Charlie Brown's plans. They, they wind up heading in the wrong direction. Is there anyone who can tell me what this life is about? Here's what I want you to know. It's this. It's this. This is the way of Christ, the way of God, the way of love, the way of us. This is the answer to those questions. But Simeon says, you'll have to make a decision. It's appointed now as a sign, a signpost. It's pointing you where you're supposed to go. Will you turn towards it? Or will you turn away? Will you bow your heads with me in prayer? It's going to be a little different kind of invitation because we're going to not only use this invitation to invite those of you who, who ought to respond to what you've heard. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But also as a way for those of you with this little cup in your hands to prepare your own heart to take the Lord's Supper. And so if you don't have one of these cups, everybody with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, but if you haven't gotten a a cup and a a piece of bread, if you'll just lift your hand, uh, one of our servant deacons will will help you. Just lift your hand. Look around, I don't see anyone. I think everybody's ready. So in 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul is teaching about how to take the Lord's Supper, and he says to consider the body to take a moment to search your own soul the way Simeon told Mary to to recognize her own soul. Was going to be pierced by the gospel. Would you let the Christ child pierce your soul? He pierces it with the piercing of his own life for you. Is this your word? Is this your definition of love? Is this who God is to you? Is this the way in which you're walking in Christ Jesus? Body given, blood spilled. Life poured out for others, for you. A life given for you, placed in you, and lived through you for the world. You ponder these things. And then there may be those of you here this morning who like Charlie Brown, if you're honest, you've never really understood the Christmas story. But this morning, you've come to grasp its essential element. It's all about Jesus. Well, in a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And it's called an invitation. And there's no greater Sunday to give your life to Christ. To walk towards this sign of God than this morning. And so this morning, if you want to come, as we sing, I'm going to be standing here at the altar and you can come and I'll talk with you about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. If you need a church home where we can walk after this Jesus together, you can make that known today. But this is Christmas, and this is Christ. And do you understand it? Father, I pray that the same Holy Spirit that filled Simeon to see the Christ child rightly, that same Holy Spirit would fill us that we would see the Christ child rightly. Help us to respond in obedience to what you're calling us to, that we wouldn't leave this place without having done business with your gospel. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand? John's going to lead us in this hymn of invitation. And as we sing, if you're stirred this morning, as we sing, you come.
thank you and you can be seated. We're going to celebrate this Lord's Supper together. Now we've taken some time to get our hearts and minds ready for it. This, this is Christ the King. Haste, haste to bring him laud. That means haste, haste to bring him praise. Because he is the one in whom all of God's promises are kept. As Paul says, he's God's yes to you this morning. And so if you would, uh, there's, a, there's a, a top little tab. It's clear. I know you can do it. And pull that off and that'll expose that wafer. All right. Wow, this is a lot noisier than I thought it would be. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Well, we are here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We are here uh, in the lead up to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. It's good as a family of believers to celebrate this meal together. And so Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. And I didn't mention this. For those of you who are online, I hope you've gotten your, your bread and your, your juice together as well. We are gathered in the Spirit around these elements. And, and Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. Would you join me in prayer real quickly? Father, help us to rightly understand the body of Christ. Isaiah chapter 53, he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. This, this bread broken up and, 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 and distributed all over this congregation is a picture. Your son Jesus willingly broken apart for us. Receiving into his body the wounds we should have taken for our own sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own way. And the Lord has placed on him the iniquity of us all. Lord, help us to understand the body of Christ given for us that we might be this body, broken, sent out, <coughs> suffering in righteousness, giving completely because of what's been done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. He broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And now the little strip on the cup. Careful. Nicely done. And Paul writes, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Pray with me again. Father, now we have taken in bread, the fruit of the vine, a symbol of blood shed for us. Now you can dismiss us. Now you can send us from this place. Now we understand what Christmas is all about. Now we understand how to answer the question of the world. Thank you for filling us with your life by sending us your son, Jesus, the babe, the son of Mary. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Brent. Thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, those cups, you can place those in the cup holders, or as you leave, you can take them out. There are some trash cans out in the commons areas that you can put them as well. But thank you for being with us. We just remembered our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he did for us. Also today, following Sunday school at 11 o'clock, we'll have a special remembrance service if you've lost a loved one this past year and you'd like to be a part of that service, we'll light a candle. 
uh, in memory of all our members who've died this past year, or if you have someone in your family you'd like to recognize, it'll be right across the hall in the fellowship hall. You're welcome to join us at 11 o'clock. There won't be any activities uh, this Wednesday night, but on Christmas Eve night, this coming Thursday night, we'll have two Christmas Eve services. Hopefully you've already signed up for one of those. There's one at 4 o'clock and then one at 5.30. We do ask that you go online or call the church office to sign up for a free ticket as we do have limited seating at both of those services. So don't forget that. Next Sunday, uh, Sunday following Christmas, we'll have one worship service again. A little bit different time, so listen real closely. Next Sunday, the service will be at 9 o'clock. Say that with me. Next Sunday, the service will be at 9 You've got it, so don't forget, right? So pass the word. Uh, one service only, no Sunday school next week, but we do have Sunday school following when we dismiss here in just a moment. Uh, pastor asked me to remind you mighty men of prayer, if you're part of that prayer group that meets on Tuesday mornings at 6.30, you will be meeting this uh, coming Tuesday and the following Tuesday as well. As you leave today, if you came prepared to give your tithes and offering, there are offering plates at each of the doors as you leave out today. We encourage you to do that. And as we leave today, we're a little bit larger number than normal for this service, of course. We will leave by section, so we'll start over here with this section, then here, then here, then there. We encourage you to wear your mask as you travel about between places, Sunday school and everything, and help us with that. And we appreciate that very much. Let's stand now. We'll have our closing prayer. And again, thank you for being with us today. Father, we come before you today. We just praise you and thank you so much for who you are and what you've done for us. Father, you've so clearly demonstrated your love for us by what you did by giving the very best gift you could give, your only son, Jesus. And Father, we're amazed at how you came, that you came as a little bitty baby, born in a nowhere place to a no-name couple. And Father, just you came in such an humble way. And Father, then you lived your life among us. And then, Jesus, you went to the cross and you died for us. You demonstrated your love for us, Lord, and while we were yet sinners, you died for us. So, Father, as we go out now, help us to go out to proclaim the true meaning of Christmas, that we among all people, we do know what the real meaning of Christmas is. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.